Hey everyone, thank you so much for taking the time to tune in to listen to this talk today. As we said, I'm gonna be speaking about the overview of tremors and their management, trying to make it practical and educational, and of course, because it's a movement lecture, interesting with some interesting videos. So this is sort of my overview, my algorithm of how I approach tremors. Tremors are rhythmic and oscillatory. So is there a tremor? Yes or no? We'll be focusing mostly on the yes side, but quickly, if it's not rhythmic or oscillatory, if it's ballistic, if it's a large movement, if it doesn't have a sinuous relationship with um, the appendage, then we're thinking that it is not a tremor and it is something else. Um, hyperkinetic movements could either be chorea or athetosis. Non-rhythmic could be ballis ballism, myoclonus. Um, and if it's not a hyperkinetic movement, but a hypokinetic movement, then you're thinking of rigidity and spasticity and things that fall along into that category. But if it is a tremor, because that's what we're talking about, if it's a rest tremor, then it's Parkinson's disease until proven otherwise. We'll talk about some special occasions where a little bit of essential tremor and some Holmes tremor can also have a rest tremor, but really rest tremor is Parkinson's disease. And then under action tremor, you have your largest differential of a postural tremor, a kinetic tremor through the entire action, a test specific tremor, which is usually a dystonic tremor, an isometric tremor, which really comes with weight and exercise. But everybody has a tremor. I tell my patients, we all hum at some rate. Some of us just hum more than others. So when we're thinking about that rate and frequency, we can think that there is a way to manage it even without medications. If you adjust the tone of the appendage and if you adjust the weight impact on the appendage, then you can change the frequency of the tremor. And with all tremor management, we're really trying to make it manageable. Nothing is going to make the tremor go away completely. Nothing is gonna stop it completely. So if we can make it more manageable for the patients through any means, then that is a practical solution for them. Where do tremors come from? They come from the brain. So there are central oscillators in the brain and parts of the basal ganglia are part of it, parts of the cerebellum are part of it, um, the thalamus are part of it. And when these central oscillators essentially get out of whack, for lack of a better term, we start to have a tremor. And then that translates through to the spinal cord and then from the spinal cord to the muscles and then to the oscillatory movement that we see in the head, in the vocal cords, in the, in the arm, in the leg, wherever it might be. And the two loops, the central loop and the peripheral loop are really where we try to impact most of our interventions. So talking about Parkinson's tremor, cause that's really the tremor everybody thinks about. We all know about the direct and indirect pathway, but when it comes to tremors, it's not so direct. So when we talk about the direct and indirect pathway briefly, the direct pathway drives movement, the indirect pathway inhibits movement, DDII. And when we think about that inhibition of movement, it's really the bradykinesia, the slowness, the stiffness that we think about. Not so much the tremor, because the tremor pathway is far more complex. But it's important to know because it interacts in some way. Now, when we think about the Parkinson's tremor, we always think about a rest tremor. And I'll play this as I'm talking. There are different types of rest tremor. The classic one is the one we see here. It's a fast tremor. It happens when the uh, appendage is not engaged. There's also a postural tremor, and this is type two. And so if you're evaluating someone for Parkinson's disease, always have them do this motion of raising their arms because if the tremor goes away with movement but then reemerges, that's something that's pathognomonic. And then there's the type three tremor, which is really very little rest tremor and much more of a postural kinetic tremor. That often is what gets confused with essential tremor. So speaking of essential tremor, Thinking about the pathophysiology for this, everybody thinks of it as a cerebellar condition, and it is, but we are appreciating that this might be more on the neurodegenerative spectrum than we originally thought. Um, that's to say there are things that impact patients with longstanding essential tremor that we can't ignore. They have cognitive problems, they have balance issues, things like that. And then pathologically, there have been Lewy bodies that have been shown to be part of uh, the cerebellar atrophy in essential tremor. There's also other hypotheses, including the GABA hypothesis, where um, GAB, there are low GABA levels in CSF for patients. But what I think it really focuses on is the oscillatory network hypothesis. And again, this idea of things that are supposed to be working in sync are no longer in sync. And because of that, it manifests as a tremor um, that we can see. So when we're talking about our tremor differential, we're really talking about the differential of action tremor. So we have essential tremor, tremor predominant PD, task specific dystonia, enhanced physiologic tremor, drug induced action tremor, Eftas and Wilson's. 
The last two are on the list because, as a good movement disorder specialist, they have to be. Practically speaking, do we see them commonly? No. But they are, you are able to test for them, and especially with Wilson's, it's treatable. So it is something that you should think about if you have um, a younger patient in your clinic that's presenting with an abnormal movement and possibly some other um, uh, complementary conditions. So let's take a look at some videos now. And I'll start this one. And I'll play them in tandem so we can see. They take a little bit of time to load. But again, when we're talking about a central tremor, we're talking about something that happens with action. So this tremor is persistent through the entire movement that this patient is doing. And you can compare that to the rest tremor of Parkinson's disease. When she raised and lifted her arms, the tremor wasn't there, but then it started to reemerge. You can also see that the tremor looks a little bit different. The Parkinson's tremor is a little bit faster. Um, it happens when um, in, in a smaller amplitude. The essential tremor, depending on where they are in their movement and in their axis, can have a larger amplitude and a bigger impact. So when we're evaluating a tremor patient, what we really wanna do is have the patient do the thing that brings out the tremor because it is, you know, not helpful for anybody if they're coming in to talk to you about a tremor and you've seen them and you've talked to them and you're examining them and you don't actually see the tremor during the course of the visit. So do the thing that the patient knows has an impact on the tremor. And classically, it's the spiral drawing when we're evaluating an essential tremor patient, but it doesn't only have to be just that. If that other patient said, really, my tremor happens when I'm trying to pour liquid from the coffee pot into the coffee cup in the morning, mimic that movement. Or I'm eating soup and it goes everywhere, mimic that movement. When we're getting a tremor patient history, as with everything, 95% of our diagnosis can come from the history. So the age when the, of the patient when the tremor started, the character of the tremor, is it at rest, is it with action, is it rhythmic, is it not, does it come, does it go, um, has it spread, did it start in one hand and then move over to another hand, was it only in both hands, was it only in both legs, um, did it spread across different sides of the body in different appendages, because this can sometimes give you an idea of a functional tremor or things like that. With the tremor, do they get a feeling of discomfort or pulling? Typically, tremor is not painful, but if it's a dystonic tremor, it may have a sensation of tired muscles, um, a sensation of the body wanting to move in a certain way and they're fighting it and that's where the tremor comes from. And of course, is there any family history of tremor? Other medical history that may enhance a tremor, the other medicines that they might be on, if they have thyroid issues, if there are dietary conditions that they might have, um, gluten sensitivity, uh, ataxia, ataxic type tremor in that picture, do they drink 20 cups of coffee a day that it might cause an enhanced physiologic tremor. Um, for the medications that they're taking, things that we know that are notorious are lithium, Depakote antipsychotics, um, amiodarone, steroids, and then the rest of the list as you can see. SSRIs are important to mention because so many people are on them at varying degrees of, of dosages. And if they, have an, if they have a physiologic tremor that they're more prone to, these can absolutely bring it out. Those will typically be fast tremor, bilateral type tremors, but if they noticed in conjunction with starting that medication, it can absolutely be the case. So as we were saying for the exam, do the thing that brings out the tremor. Um, I have lots of toys in my room. Um, so if I want to see something, I'll have them mimic it so that I can tell. I have people paint their nails sometimes. I have uh, people that play instruments, bring in their instruments, whatever it might be. Because this doing the finger to nose is inadequate. That'll get an intention tremor, that'll get an ataxic picture, but it's not gonna get to everything. Take note of ab abnormal posturing if you're worried about um, issues with uh, dystonia and take note of distractibility and entrainment. And that's when we're looking for um, uh, functional tremors and, and, and psychogenic tremors and things like that. Um, entrainment and really means if you give someone a rhythm, all of a sudden that tremor will start to uh, pulsate in the rhythm that you're giving them. Counting backwards from 100, all of a sudden, every time they say the number, that's when the tremor really becomes most pronounced. Distractibility, um, if you can't have them count backwards or they've done that and the tremor is still persisting, have them like trace a figure eight on the floor with their foot. You really have to concentrate to do that and see how if the tremor remains or, or diminishes. If you need something a bit more objective, this is a DAT scan. 
Uh, it stands for dopamine active transporter. And this is useful in helping to distinguish Parkinson's tremor from other types of tremor, whether it's um, essential tremor, drug-induced Parkinsonism, things like that. It looks at how well the brain metabolizes dopamine. It looks at presynaptic dopamine deficit. So if there is a deficiency, um, you're going to go from a nice comma appearance like you see to two smaller period appearances, or it'll just be asymmetric. One side will be like a period and the other side will be like a comma. So for essential tremor tidbits, family history we always think of, but really family history only correlates with age of presentation. And if it happens later in life, the likelihood of family history being there will be less likely. Typically it's an action tremor, which is what we normally think of, but if patients have long-standing essential tremor, there can be a rest component to it, and there can also be some cogwheeling that's seen. So here's where the uh, picture sometimes gets a little bit muddy and where a DAT scan might be helpful in coming into play. And what we said before, the cerebellum does more than just balance. So cognitive issues can be seen, um, ataxic pictures, hearing and speech issues, like scanning speech and things like that can be seen for people with longstanding essential tremor. Again, for the last two on the list, FTAS, this is a genetic condition. So if you're seeing a woman um, who has a family history of tremor uh, and it's just a really coarse tremor that it's not responding the usual interventions and in ways that you would think of for essential tremor, um, you might wanna think of, texting for, uh, of checking for this. It's an X-linked dominant, so it would be a carrier, and it's the FMR1 gene. It is available commercially. It doesn't change management, but it can give you some um, uh, intervention, uh, uh, some information about diagnostic purposes. And then for Wilson's, again, this is treatable. It's not seen commonly, but I will say that I've, I've seen and treated two patients for Wilson's disease um, since fellowship and in practice. It Again, a young patient that might start to have some mild uh, psychological changes, changes in personality, obsessive compulsiveness, things like that. Um, they may uh, start to have a little bit of dystonia or abnormal posturing that you see. And then you have the typical screening tests that you can do. And if you catch it early enough, um, treatment with diet and chelation and maintenance therapy with zinc. And so this is a video of a young woman with Wilson's. And this is very typical actually of the patient that I had in fellowship. It's a very large amplitude um, intention type action tremor. Uh, there's limb dystonia. You can see with the uh, flexing of the legs and the extension of the arm, a decreased arm swing, and then um, the Kaiser Fleischer rings and things like that. We won't go through the rest of the video for time's sake. Uh, if there was sound, uh, you would hear that this was like a scanning speech dysarthric type picture, which is really long drawn out syllables and long drawn out words like, hello, I'm speaking very slow and long like that. And a little bit of Parkinsonism with increased tone that you can see. So how do we manage tremor? The medical management of essential tremor honestly hasn't changed um, from what you are likely used to, but the thing to take note of is the therapeutic dose range. So if you have someone on propranolol or mycelin and they're on the lower end of the spectrum, you may wanna push it up a little bit higher if they can tolerate it. As we know, these medicines do have side effects, cardiac that you have to watch with the indorol and cognitive and somnolent side effects that you have to watch with the uh, primidone mycelin. If second line therapies to look at are gabapentin, benzos can work. I will say that I do use these medications at low doses when appropriate in, in certain tremor patients, both essential tremor, physiologic, functional, and Parkinson's tremor, and Topamax as well. What's a little, oh, we'll talk about tremor management and Parkinson's disease. Uh, obviously, all the variations of levodopa. We have immediate release, carbidopa, levodopa. Uh, we have extended release through Ritari, and now an infused form through Duopa, which is done through a PEG-J. Um, there has been the evolution of amantadine, which is the first therapy that we had for Parkinson's. Extended release forms are now Gocovri and Osmolex. And then dopamine agonist, which mimic the way dopamine works in the body. 
that can be used on a regular basis or as needed. The as needed forms are apic in an injection and can be um, a sublingual strip that can be used. And when getting back to that direct and indirect pathway, adenosine they have found is more prevalent in a Parkinson's brain and is most prominent in the indirect pathway. So you, if you can inhibit adenosine, you inhibit the inhibitor and help promote movement. And that's the new medication called Norantz. Something that's a little bit outside of the box and something that I do, because if you think back to ways to address the tremor, if you can affect the tone of the limb, then you might help impact the frequency. So botulinum toxin. Botulinum toxin is just a muscle relaxant. You can put them into the flexor muscles. They're the stronger muscles and maybe dampen the frequency of the tremor to make it more manageable for the patients. And then surgical management of Parkinson's tremor. You've already seen this um, with uh, Dr. Sarkar this morning. So for the sake of time, I won't go through the videos again. But when it comes to tremor, it's phenomenal in its management of treating the symptom. So quickly, as we are almost finishing up, drug-induced tremor. Um, this is an enhanced physiologic tremor. So... You can see it's fine and fast, it's bilateral. Um, it doesn't look like that Parkinsonian rest tremor. Um, it really isn't diffuse throughout the body. It mostly affects the hands. So again, getting that history of a patient that may have started SSRI, that might be on lithium, that may be on steroids, this may be enhancing their regular physiologic tremor that they already experience. If we're looking for a dystonic tremor, this is usually seen in the neck um, for cervical dystonia, but it can be in the hands and it can be in the legs as well. But it's much more irregular. Um, it's larger amplitude, it's slower, and there may be some abnormal posturing that comes along with it. You can see the shoulder is elevated. Um, this is treated mostly by botulinum toxin. Uh, if the patient can't tolerate toxin or doesn't want to do the injections, then artane or trihexaphenidyl can be used. And it has that null point, which you saw, where if you go into a particular position, the tremor diminishes. So this is a Holmes tremor. And this is one of those other aspects of a, um, a rest tremor that we were talking about. And this comes with any disruption in, in the midbrain pathways. What you can see is it definitely happens at rest. It's unilateral like a Parkinson's tremor, but look at how much slower it is compared to what a typical Parkinson's tremor would be. Um, treatment for this is really symptomatic at best. You can use toxin, you can use meds for a tremor, whether it be essential tremor or Parkinson's tremor, but it doesn't always work to as best as it can because you're borrowing. Um, so this is a wing beating tremor. This is just to show you what it looks like. This isn't pathologic of any particular condition. It's anything that disrupts the dentorobothalamic pathway. Um, in this case, uh, this gentleman had CJD, um, but it can be seen in MS. It can be seen um, in a stroke, uh, whatever might be a structural abnormality. And it's a very large amplitude tremor and it'll come out in just a little bit as he tries to raise his arm up and down. You saw it a little bit before. But when you see it, this is what it's called. It's a wing beating tremor, um, and it just is indicative of location for localization, not necessarily indicative of the pathology. And it'll come out in just a sec. There it is. You can't miss it when you see it. And so this is a task-specific writer's tremor. Um, and I show this because this is why you have to have the patient do what, the pa what brings out the tremor for the patient. There's no postural tremor in this patient. He's completely still. There is no intention tremor with finger to nose. Um, you'll see in a little bit that he's going to drink out of a cup. He gets that cup to his mouth and drinks without any problem. But there, he's coming in because of there's a concern that every time he puts pen to paper, um, it's very difficult for him to write. He has a, um, a writer's tremor. And when treating a task-specific tremor like this, which you'll see in just a second, again, it gets to really mechanics. Um, so what's next to it is something called pen again. And what this is, is a pen that changes the tone of the arm by how the posture of the arm is um, displayed while they're writing. And it hooks between your index finger or your middle finger, and it forces you to raise the elbow up. Um, and it just allows you to have more control over the, over the pen when you bring it to the paper. Other things, if they're, if that can also be tried, are botulinum toxin. 
So we're finishing up with our tremor takeaways. Um, tremor involves almost every aspect of the neuroaxis. It's key to examine the patient doing the task that brings out the tremor. Um, things look really similar. So tremor predominant PD and essential tremor of the hands can look a lot alike. Cervical dystonia and essential tremor of the head can look a lot alike. Um, so sometimes objective things like the DAT scan can be helpful distinguishing between PD and ET. There are more than oral meds to treat. Simple things like weighted utensils and ergonomic strategies, botulinum toxin um, if oral medicines are not cutting it um, to the best of their ability, and of course surgery, but that's not a last resort. And lastly, if it moves funny, um, email a friend. I, I see videos constantly and I'm happy to comment and give my two cents if it would be helpful. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jill. That was great. <clears throat> and as usual, there is extensive questions. So I'll try to get through uh, as many as I can. So I'm going to apologize for those I don't get to. Um, this is a great question. What is the use of and is there a value to medical marijuana for movement disorders? And if so, what type of disorders? Sure. So medical marijuana is something that can be helpful in movement disorders, particularly in those of high tone, um, uh, spasticity, uh, pain, dystonias, things like that. When it comes to tremor, it's a little bit more hit or miss. There's always those videos on YouTube of somebody taking a, a puff of a joint or a bite of a brownie and all of a sudden their tremors go away. So for that, I say take it with a grain of salt. But in Parkinson's disease, non-motor symptoms are just as important as motor symptoms. Things like um, anxiety, sleep disturbances, uh, depression, and pain. And we do know that there is a role for medical marijuana in those conditions. And I'm licensed to prescribe, and that is how I use it mostly with my patients. That's great. And when do you decide to go over to the surgical path? Because we know that a lot of the medicines that you offer for Parkinson's has side effects that people, especially can be somewhat more disabling than the actual mm -hmm. resting tremor itself. So when do you decide to, to uh, go to that surgical path? Sure, so it depends on the symptom you're trying to treat. Tremor, you can think surgery much sooner rather than later because that is actually the one treatment, like the one symptom like we were saying because the pathway is so complex that doesn't always respond to medicines as much as we thought. And so surgery sooner rather than later is absolutely appropriate in that regard. When someone has Parkinson's for a longer time, they have been more established on the medications, but the medications are starting to lose their effectiveness or they're needing to take them more frequently. Surgery can then be used to help restore some of that on time between doses so that they can reduce some of their meds, get some tremor control, some improvement in stiffness and slowness because those are the other motor features that uh, surgery helps with. And then um, essentially reset the clock because while it's not a cure, um, the disease will still progress underneath it, they do get better symptomatic management. And for essential tremor, again, because DBS is what tremor treats best, you can think of it very early on, especially if the medications aren't working. Thank you. Uh, I do, I'm gonna try to understand this question. And if I ask it wrong, I apologize. But it says, from your perspective, why aren't progressive tremor development a byproduct, I'm assuming, or is progressive tremor problems, can that result in focal to bilateral tonic-clonic seizures? Can one progress to another and do they share similar pathways? So I don't know about the pathways, but I will tell you there is a large overlap between epilepsy and movement disorders when it comes to myoclonus. Sometimes it's cortical, sometimes it's not. And really that gets into autoimmune movement disorders. That's where they overlap most. Um, so if you are seeing patients with a tremor that might progress to a more generalized uh, uh, myoclonic picture, then we want to start thinking about maybe um, an autoimmune etiology. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have time okay. for. Um, and again, Jill, as usual, that's just a, a wonderful talk. And, Thank you. and you can see based on the questions, it really it generates a lot of interest from the audience. Thank you again. Thanks, everyone.